what COVID-19 has done has to accelerate so many of the trends that we've seen before and have just fast forwarded them in many ways. So digitalization is not a new topic. Um, we've been speaking about that for a long time. We've been seeing these models coming up for the best part of two, three decades. Um, but what has clearly happened is that both in our usage of digital technologies and in the way in which those technologies are transforming our societies, we've seen a step change. Um, and what happened at um, a snail space is now running if, at a South African at a springbok pace. It has accelerated quite dramatically. Um, and it's happening across our society in, in how we work. Um, we're not sipping um, half cold coffee outside a boardroom. We are actually um, um, sipping hot coffee in our own rooms while we talk to you all around the world. Um, people are suddenly trading a lot more on um, online. Um, they are um, holding schools online. We do a lot more medical consultations online. And so every aspect of our society, we've moved online. Um, what was interesting, just in Rwanda, where we also working, um, there's been a dramatic increase in digital transactions um, in some categories, 30 or 40 fold. So people are really adopting this technology. And then this afternoon, we're going to speak about um, what that looks like. Um, and, you know, the way in which it's confronting us to think also about um, trends like social exclusion that occurred before the pandemic, they existed before the pandemic, and they've certainly accelerated. Um, and how these things are playing out is the topic of, of our panel. Um, so I want to welcome um, um, Ben Roberts, who's with Liquid Telecom. I want to welcome Komi Valdemarium. He's with the um, IBM Research Labs. I'll say a bit more about each one of them now. Um, Eliane Ubal Ubali Joro. I've actually practiced it, but I knew I was going to get something not so right. Eliane sits in Canada, as you know. And Annabelle Schiff, who sits um, also in in um, um, in a distant, colder climate. She's with Caribou Digital. Um, and I'm going to ask each one of them to um, just say a little bit about their experience of digitalization during the pandemic and their take on this question of what is it taking our society? Are we seeing some gaps? Um, what's happening with infrastructure? Um, are we finding major gaps? Are we able to rapidly deploy? Um, so let's kick off with Ben. Um, Ben is sitting in the UK. He's Liquid Telecom's Group Chief Technology and Innovation Officer. Um, he's been working in this field a lot. Um, he's been working with networking and product strategy. Um, Liquid is a major provider of fiber infrastructure and cloud infrastructure across the um, on the continent. So Ben is a good person to start with when it really goes about um, what's happening with infrastructure and hard infrastructure across the continent. So Ben, yeah, your take on all of this. Thanks, Henny. Um, so yes, thank you, um, and uh, happy to be here. Um, so I'm sitting in UK today, but I'm, I'm normally uh, based in Nairobi. Um, and so, I mean, you know, it's December now, it's the 9th of December, but um, I feel like I've been, we've been talking about this for a while now. Um, and, you know, it was around late March when uh, things started to change in, in Kenya. There was immediate response to the first coronavirus case and uh, with some measures that were there that, that changed um, some of the way things are done. Um, and so I, I wrote a, an article early in April, uh, which was entitled, Did Coronavirus Just kickstart the digital economy um, and you know in that um, article I, I, I picked on something that had been published by Forbes just before that uh, which was talking around uh, a coronavirus human digital accelerant um, so we built a lot of infrastructure as Liquid Telecom and, and fiber and data centers and um, we, you know if you are a business that is in Nairobi and you've got a good fiber connection um, or you're in 
Kisumu or Mombasa or any of the main cities. Um, you know, you've built up a network. You've been in for a process of digital transformation for some years, like a bank or a telco or, um, you know, the, these companies are, are quite mature in some kind of a digital transformation curve. We've been able to adapt pretty quickly. Then you've got born in the cloud businesses like Uber and uh, Jumia and, you know, these e-commerce businesses and, and, and ride hailing businesses and stuff. You know, these are also, uh, you know, born that way. So they didn't need to digitally transform. They're born digital businesses. So business has been, you know, to a certain extent able to, to pivot, uh, but not every business has been that far down, you know, the, the, the digital transformation journey. Um, but it was the human behavior that changed with, with, with people who are used to getting in the car and driving through the traffic and going to the office. You know, we were forced to stay at home. We were forced to not only join these incessant um, video calls that we're doing right now, but we were forced to, um, you know, start signing documents online, start doing more on email, start doing our business in, in a digital way. So this is what the human coronavirus accelerant is all about. Um, we had the tools at our disposal to to do this thing, and, and we and Liquid have been a multi-country organization. We've been used to doing this collaboration uh, online a lot, but we saw it in the first three weeks of um, our offices, you know, starting with the UK and then progressing to Africa, closing down. We saw this uptake in people collaborating online using these collaboration tools. Um, really, really big. We see from the infrastructure point of view, we've seen uh, internet traffic shifting from you know business using home using internet in the business uh, to, act, to you know to do your stuff when you're in the office. People using it at home. There's been a shift in the way internet traffic has gone. It's been able to handle it. Infrastructure's been ready. Um, however, um, you know. I've talked about e-commerce, which has seen this, you know, a big kicker up and in, in uptake, as well as the, the things you mentioned, Henny, and education and, and health. Um, but really, it is in the space of education that we've seen um, perhaps the biggest exposure of a digital divide. Um, so if you are a child who has or, or a teacher who's working in or a pupil of a private school in Nairobi, you probably have a, a decent computer network and a fast Internet connection. and and you've probably got broadband at home and, and devices and phones to access the internet. You know, those those children have been able to go home and keep on learning, and, and uh, those teachers have been able to, from somewhere, keep on teaching. Um, but if you are a pupil or a teacher in a rural school somewhere in in in, uh, in you know, Massabet County, you probably had no learning or teaching whatsoever. Um, there has been a fallback to radio and television, but that is not interactive and, and self-paced learning doesn't work for infants. Um, but we have, as Liquid Telecom, we provided internet uh, to you know about 300 uh, public schools in Kenya under a project from the, from the Universal Service Fund, and we've been a, mostly there in Western Kenya, and we've really been work, able to work with uh, the teachers, starting with the ICT teachers, moving on to other subjects, using the ICT teachers to train other teachers. You know, we've been able to bring on industry partners, Microsoft, Cisco, Kenya um, Internet Domain Registry, Kenic. Uh, other local companies and edutech companies as well, Angaza, Ilimu, and others. We've been able to expose these companies, connect them up with teachers, use these digital tools. And we've really seen, you know, where infrastructure is there. The teachers are able to do this. You know, digital schools are rising. So um, where infrastructure and broadband is there, the pivot is possible, the skills can be developed. Where infrastructure isn't there, no learning at all. Thanks, Ben. In other words, what, what I hear you saying is... Um, the availability of infrastructure is indeed a, a divide between those that are able to utilize and those who are not able to utilize. Thank you very much. Um, let's go over to um, to Cami. Um, so Cami Valdemariam is is the head of research at, at Africa Labs for IBM. Um, he's um, I think normally based in um, in Nairobi as well, um, and he's been really borrowing away at the forefront of big data, AI, blockchain, these technologies that are facilitating <coughs> much of the, the digital world and business models now. Um, and, you know, the, the, the IBM um, lab has really been closely linked to expanding these technologies into areas like education, healthcare, 
there's trade logistics. He's been working on climate. There's food supply chains. Um, the pandemic has disrupted supply chains. Kami, I mean, you you do the research, but you also have practical solutions. You've got a number of patents registered. So what's your take on what has happened here and is happening here? Um, thank you and good afternoon and good morning for some of you. And yeah, thanks. Um, so maybe I start introducing myself, right? So I'm Kwame, uh, just on top of what you said, I'm, I'm Ethiopian. Uh, I lived everywhere, I would say. And I have been working with IBM for the last eight years. And before that, I was a professor. And uh, before I was uh, was entrepreneur. So in, I have been in the space of digital technology, paid in education, healthcare, agriculture, and so forth. And that actually what you see that the patent that uh, I filed over 250, which is a result of the innovation I've been working on in this space. So when coming to the topic of um, rural education, I think I, 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 I agree with what Ben said, uh, infrastructure is the key for uh, digitization. So, uh, what I have been experiencing for the past several years, in, in particular in, in the space of education, is really uh, think of back, go back beyond uh, before COVID 19, right? So, you have seen around the world there's a significant shift toward technology enabled blended learning, right? Where student learns at least in part, and at the kind of at the, at the brick and mortar facility and through online delivery means, and with some student control over time, space, and part or pace of the learning process themselves, right? So however, what you really see that uh, these different modes of learning are not well integrated, and this leads to what we call fragmentation of the overall learning teaching experiences, right? Uh, now that coupled with the lack of infrastructure, be it in the, at the core hardware level, or at the uh, communication level, or at the even content digitization level, uh, caused a lot of drama among the education ecosystem. And uh, glad Ben mentioned the Limo and all other players. And back uh, 2012, I kicked off a project, what we call uh, uh, Cognitive Learning Companion for African classrooms. So the idea was really what you see there may be limited or no infra information sharing between traditional classroom learning, which is delivered by human teachers, and outside classroom learning using an automated tutoring, what you see, this qualification of uh, startups being pop up to do the uh, such learning technologies. So online systems and kind of are often perceived as an, an additional burden. But this is what we see, we have studied across the educational sector, an additional burden that lacks context and rather than a natural partner that provides real value added and actionable instead to the teacher who basically controls the learning pathway for the students. And at times, what happens is that issues of control over the teaching process may cause computer-mediated learning, which is what the ICT-mediated learning, to be even perceived as a threat with human teachers being replaced. That is a question being asked. And so when you're introducing the digital technologies and digital means for the teacher, there's always a perception that will human teachers be replaced. So ultimately, these challenges are can have a disruptive influence in the overall learning process and it's to what we call, used to call it, this what the suboptimal outcome. So are you achieving partial learning or full learning? So, and there's a confusion what we are learning in this digital era, a mix of core technology versus learning, right? So if you are just, most of us here as educators, if you think of education as a digital, uh, enabled technology. So what these two things cannot go separate what is affective and cognitive process in learning, right? So learner's state is a combination of the cognitive and affective components, right? So which is considerably um, uh, in the research committee, in the technology committee, what you have seen, the focus on cognitive aspect, what skills are the students trying to learn? 
what prior skills do they have? What is their current level of competency level, concept level, understanding level? What content and assessment should they do to next based on what they learn? So how digital technology basically facilitating this? So today what you see is really, are you digitizing the entire process of learning and teaching? Are you digitizing the content? Are you digitizing providing ICT support for the teacher and the students? What are you digitizing? So these are all the questions we uh, really didn't get answered before COVID era. Now, COVID actually proved these problems go worse, right? The digital divide being at the soft computing level becoming wider, at the core infrastructure level becoming wider, as been said. So the nuanced understanding of this effective process in learning and their interplay with the community process is a holistic approach toward learning learning digitalization cannot be really developed without really going around in the value-driven smart partnership we call it. Partnership is involving the government, private sector, and policymakers to actually come together to sh in this shifting the digital e education era to think beyond actually infrastructure innovation, we try to remove the traditional burning of time and space and simplifying the access to content experience. And this is, requires a learning and relearning to teachers and students in the ecosystem, making this interaction and engagement the centerpiece of what it was a new learning experience beyond really merely on just digitization and infrastructure. So I will stop there. And uh, that's what uh, I, I, uh, I, my, my point I was trying to make is we really need to come together from different point of view. But I think beyond technology, when we talk about learning, what does it mean? That's my, my, my comeback here. So. Kobe, thank you very much for, um, for that, um, challenging us on, the, on what learning means with all its facets. Um, let me introduce um, Eliane Ubalijoro. She's the Professor for Practice for Public-Private Sector Partnerships at McGill University. Um, she's deeply engaged in Rwanda, where she's the um, on the National Science and Technology Council and the Presidential Advisory Council. Um, she helps the African Development Bank as part of a expert global community of practice on COVID-19. Um, and as I've discovered, she's um, a very keen discussant. Um, Eliane, your take on all of this. So, um, thank you. I just want to say I'm also the Deputy Executive Director for Global Open Data in Agriculture and Nutrition. And uh, so the work, my day job at GODAN, uh, the acronym for Global Open Data in Agriculture and Nutrition, is how can digitalization help us ensure food security and nutrition around the world? So COVID-19 has been a huge setback in terms of the SDGs, uh, the goals we have towards 2030. And what we know is that of the 800 million people who were food insecure before uh, COVID-19 hit, is that the, the, the risks are this will reach 1.2 um, billion people who go home, who go hungry every day and above the 800 million. There's 2.7 billion people before COVID-19 who are food insecure and 800 million who went hungry every night. And that 800 million has gone up to, may go up to 1.2 billion. And so digitalization is a critical element in the agricultural food chain in terms of how are we connecting logistically? How are we uh, bringing knowledge to farmers to ensure that they have um, adequate uh, information to know when to plant, when to harvest, how to minimize inputs so that uh, not only are they able to maximize productivity, but also make sure that the environmental impact of their production is minimized. What we know is that agricultural related um, uh, uh, inputs and energy costs uh, are a huge contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. And so part of it is how digitalization can help us improve sustainability in agriculture is critical. And so what we have seen is that in places in Africa where farmers were connected, were able to negotiate loans on phones, were able to transact to buy seeds digitally, 
they have been able to continue work as usual. And in places where this hasn't been possible, this has really affected logistically their capacity to produce, to bring food to market and reach customers. And we also know that the lockdown has been really critical. So what uh, COVID-19 has done in terms of the food security space is really accelerate the urgency of connecting all smallholder farmers in the world to value chains, to uh, consumers, so that we can ensure that the most smallholder farmers, there's over 570 million smallholder farmers in the world. They produce 75% of the food that we eat. And so having them connected is a really critical element for global food security. And as we move from a billion population in Africa to 2.6 billion by 2050, this is going to become more and more critical. And I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned. Um, on, on the weekend, I was uh, on a FAO China agricultural digitalization event. And, and the work that Alibaba has been doing to connect farmers to value chains to customers is amazing in terms of being able to predict what the plant, how much of it, and to ensure that uh, customers and farmers are linked in the most effective way to minimize post-harvest losses and to also uh, ensure uh, flow in terms of logistics. And so Alibaba is able to have farmers get loans approved over the phone uh, digitally in three minutes. And so how can we bring that level of digitalization to Africa to ensure that our smallholder farmers who contribute, agriculture contributes 30% to GDP in general in Africa. And so what we know is when farmers have access to digital technologies to guide them in terms of productions and access to markets and weather data in terms of planning, they can increase their incomes up to easily 30%. So it's really important that we look at how this can increase our capacity for agricultural productivity and also adding value along the food chain. So I see this as a really critical element. And because women play a huge part in agriculture in Africa, access to digitalization skills for women is even more important. And so Godan has about 1,100 partners around the world, and half of those are in Africa. And what's important to us is how can all of those partners, whether they're from private sector, public sector, startups, or large organizations, is how can they support this space of digitalization, skills development, and infrastructure? So I'm just going to just share one story. One of the Godan partners, AgLedger, has been working using blockchain to connect farmers to markets. And not only were, have they been able to increase farmer income by four or five times, but they've also been in, able to look at whenever part of produce wasn't of the needed quality, how can that be used in other ways to ensure that there is a, uh, a, a cycle that takes everything and there is no more waste in the system? And so this is a really important issue because whatever can be isn't used for agriculture can be used for any energy production, for compost, so fertilizer production. What can be uh, sold at high premium because of the quality can be labeled and followed through blockchain across the value chain. And for farmers, as soon as these different steps are met, they can be paid immediately. And so this helps them planning in the long term. And so what we see is that as we look at the future of how we're going to feed the planet sustainably and meet the sustainable development close, digitalization is a really critical element at all levels of production, of how we face climate change, and how do we put enabling policies to support this needed infrastructure and skills development for youth to enter the space of agriculture. In Africa right now, the average age of a farmer is 59 years old. So it's really critical that we bring more youth to the space, especially that half of the workforce around the planet by 2035 is going to be African. And so we really need to have that digitalization space connect our food systems to youth, to our capacity to produce food and have sustainable solutions that help Africa mitigate uh, climate change. So I really see uh, this um, space of digitalization, skills development and infrastructure really important for Africa right now, crucially because of COVID. Thanks, Eliane. Did, did you say that the average age of farmers in Africa was about 59? Was that, yes. did I hear you correctly? Yes, yes, yes. We have an aging uh, farming population, and this is something we urgently need to, to change because young people don't see farming as, as exciting. And so if we can associate digitalization 
to farming. This is a way to really transform the system and make young people more connected. And so this is why I see uh, the areas of AI and blockchain being brought to the space of agriculture are ways to, to be connected. And that's why, for me, the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences is a really important element in this space and, and training all these young people to be able to solve the solutions that is a really critical one. How do we feed Africa? is important and how do we make agricultural sexy through digitalization is a really critical one that I'm passionate about too. Now that's great. You know, as a farmer, I was just trying to check whether I'm adding or detracting from the average, but I won't go further into that. <laughs> Thanks, Eliana. So let's um, let's go to Annabelle Schiff. She's a director with um, Caribou Digital, which is a firm that <clears throat> provides I think a variety of advisory services and strategy services um, in the area of, of inclusive digital economies. Um, she worked a lot on digital platforms before and probably still does. Um, the, the pandemic kicked in. We, we um, got connected in that regard. Um, yeah, Annabelle, give us an idea of, of, of your take on this digitalization topic. And platforms is obviously a crucial business model in the digital economy. Yeah, thanks, Henny. Um, and great to hear, you know, lots of different perspectives coming in from lots of the panelists. Um, but as you mentioned, yeah, lots of the work that we've been doing at Caribou Digital is focused around kind of uh, digital platforms and the um, uh, the opportunities that they're providing in terms of kind of creating meaningful, fulfilling job opportunities for young people um, across sub-Saharan Africa. I'll just mention two projects which relate to these discussions around kind of digitization and skills development and some of the kind of insight sites that we've seen coming out. Um, the first one is around a project that we called uh, Platform-Led Upskilling. And what we were looking, what we did through this research project was we spoke to a number of global and local platforms to understand a bit more about the role that they are playing in the skills, especially uh, digital skills development landscape um, in Africa. And we spoke to these platforms to understand a bit more about why, how, and to what effect they're investing in um, training the small scale vendors and self-employed self workers that earn a living across their platforms. And this is obviously outside of the kind of employer employee contract. So it's really interesting to kind of dig down on why they're investing so much in um, training. And two of the kind of main findings that we found was that all platforms um, are investing heavily in training, even though it's very hard, it's very expensive, especially, you know, well, especially pre-COVID, lots of this training was happening face to face. Um, but it was, you know, essential to business, especially in regions where there are significant skills gaps. What we also found was that these platforms aren't just um, investing in training in what we call platform proficiency, which is, you know, how to um, navigate the navigate the platforms that they're working on but they were also investing in training on um, digital skills which links to platform proficiency but also what we call more broadly kind of skills for a digital age so soft skills financial literacy skills etc and i think mm -hmm. this, what this really does is it highlights the fundamental kind of skills gaps that exist amongst um those in the workforce and those about to uh, enter it um and so that was yeah the platform led upskilling um uh, project that we we are still we're still running and we've been really interested to look at kind of how platforms have responded to COVID and obviously kind of the restric restrictions on face to face training and how they've been responding in that effect. Um, but more uh, recently, we've also been working on a project um, continuing on this kind of um, focus on platform workers and platform business models. And what we've done is since March, we've been speaking to a range of um, platform workers across Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda. Um, and Ghana to understand how the pandemic has impacted their lives and livelihoods. Um, and I think, you know, uh, Ben and some of the other panelists have spoken about kind of, um, you know, some, some of the digital tools existed and obviously there's been a kind of a push in terms of kind of infrastructure development um, during the pandemic. And, you know, the shift from, for example, um, going to the office to working from home has been easy to some, easy for some. So that kind of transformation and that kind of shift has been, um, easy and you know often um, there's been lots of kind of uh, uh, excitement around the introduction of digital platforms and the opportunities that they present but what we've noticed in speaking to these platform workers is kind of access to these online platforms and these digital means of work aren't necessarily a kind of panacea to um, some of the challenges that others have faced during the um, pandemic so just to kind of give you a couple of examples um, 
when we spoke to um, platform workers or platform sellers that sell their goods via social media platforms or e-commerce platforms, um, obviously you know, mm-hmm. people thought there was an opportunity in terms of um, people being able to shift their um, work online. But what we saw is that often, you know, um, supply doesn't necessarily match demand. You know, there was um, the pandemic has affected consumers. There was less commerce for non-essential goods and also lots of businesses shifted online. So there was this kind of competition that we saw there. Um, obviously not all platforms have fared well, you know, with kind of stay at home and kind of restrictions on movements, ride hailing platforms, place based platforms that, you know, rely on face to face interactions. So those that kind of connect people with carpenters or cleaners have really suffered. And then even freelancing platforms, you know, lots of people looking to these kind of Upworks and Fivers to try and find um, uh, online work. What we found from speaking to these speaking to these freelance workers is, you know, they've experienced reduced hours, cancelled contracts, and just in general, just a decrease in um, the be- the ability to access work. And perhaps you know these insights aren't necessarily about the div- digital divide per se, but more about kind of the reality of digital transformation and um, the kind of impact that COVID has had, um, and looking at kind of both the opportunities and challenges that digital platforms present. Thanks, Annabelle. Um, Thank you very much. Um, So just looking at the questions that are rolling down the side, Komi, I'm going to come to you because there's a fantastic question here. Um, And it's it's really this. Um, Would would you say, that's us as the panel, that um, increasing access to the content experience includes using African languages in teaching and education? And I mean, the uh, if I can rephrase it slightly, it's it's more than just education. Um, can I put it this way? Can um, can digital technology, in its ability to digitize our languages and give us voice recognition, help us to leapfrog some of our educational challenges and economic challenges in the same way that mobile helped us to leapfrog the line line challenges? So can 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 our ability to digitize and do voice recognition help people who, for example, in agriculture, um, you know, cannot read and write in English or cannot read and write at all, engage economically? And I mean, we had a brilliant example last year where the winner of a of a continent wide hackathon was a small group of students from the University of Cape Town, who had developed a a, a model whereby people could transact using voice via that's WhatsApp with banks um, who were illiterate potentially. Now, I mean, that's an exciting opportunity. So, Komi, I'm coming to you. You, you. you spoke almost about the technology of education and the modalities. What's your view on this? That's very interesting and also intriguing question, actually. So, um, just let me give you an edge, just even to make that a question more complex, right? So if you look at today the state of um, uh, content what are available in, in our education system, when I say education here, not just uh, formal education in classroom setting, I'm also referring to Elaine's point as agriculture education, right? Education really is it's, it's cross-disciplinary, right? So if you just give an example uh, in the classroom, uh, for the students, uh, an example of hot dog, right? So that's that the analogy of hot dog is is the Western analogy, right? And that doesn't translate to anything. And, and now imagine that translating that into a local context, what does it mean, right? So come to agriculture. When you tell to the farmer, uh, as the, most farmers are illiterate, where where what we experience it in, in our agriculture for the last couple of years. So you tell, okay, you need to plow this farm uh, in, in a wet and uh, a moisture level of uh, this uh, and the soil property of that. And this inch should be go down for the plowing uh, disc to go. So on what planet, really, the farmer understand what you are saying. So knowledge being trans- lost, right? So what is Important as I, I think uh, the, 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 uh, for for the person here, uh, we brought up this question. This is analogy, what we call analogy-based learning, right? So how do you actually take that 
to analog to an, a proper analogy that the farmer basically in an in, in a local indigenous or contextualized way he can understand how can we translate let's say an example of um, 10 inch or maybe put that most of the chatbots today or the ai support technology say okay put x amount of water or x gallon of water for this part of the farm and what does that mean? Can you translate that in a voice recognition way? Okay, put let's say, X jar of water, which is in a milliliter. You need to translate that in a, in a more contextualized way, in a more analogy way to the farmer that he can translate or she can translate to the local context. So yeah, it's important to incorporate indigenous knowledge and localized content into our education system, regardless of education at the agriculture, education at the school level, education at the healthcare facilities. Today, we spoke about blockchain. So how do you actually describe the concept of anonymity versus privacy to someone who is basically giving you the consent into, uh, into your healthcare technology, right? So the concept of consent is not perceived by the majority of our population in Africa. What does it mean? What does consent mean? Providing data access mean? What does privacy mean? That these are all foreign born concepts. How do you actually translate that in the local and indigenous way in a more actual appealing way that they, such that they can actually understand and articulate and then act on it for a better progressive future? Thanks, thanks, Kwame. I, I, I like that a lot. So, um, Eliana, I'm, I, I'm going to zoom in to you. Um, um, so, as somebody who's really looking at agriculture um, and the notion that, that digital technologies can bring people into the value chain in ways that they've never done it before, have you come across applications where, um, you know, local language capability and the ability to do that digitally um, has assisted? So, so there, there are many uh, startups working in this space in Africa, in different countries, and there are applications that are using that. And, you know, you also mentioned WhatsApp and, and being able to use video. So for people who are illiterate, being able to use WhatsApp and, and just uh, presenting their products through videos on WhatsApp has been a great way to uh, um, transcend the barrier of literacy. And so, the, and, and I also put in the chat box the Lacuna Fund that uh, has been doing a lot of work around funding related to um, natural language processing and, and how this can be really important in terms of ensuring that uh, spoken and written languages that uh, are beyond the traditional languages used, beyond English and uh, Indo-European languages, are prevented from doing having breakthroughs that are based on NLP technologies. So, so funding is available to encourage this space. There are startups that are working in this area. And what's important is really how do we ensure that the people who are eager to fill the gaps in those areas are connecting. So, for example, Digital Green has done a lot of work around digitalization and videography um, in terms of education in the agricultural space. They started out in India, but have been working in, in Ethiopia, and I think they've also been working in Kenya. And, and so part of it is how are we connecting all of the people who are interested in ensuring that language isn't a barrier, but actually is something that helps us enrich this space and ensures that all the different languages that are available that you know have uh, are given access and, and and in a way we look at biodiversity and biodiversity loss languages are important forms of of diversity that need to be cultivated so that we can ensure that we're getting diverse ways of looking at things and so this is a really critical element and for people who are looking for funding that's why i put the lacuna fund and for the others also interested in digitalization agriculture just as you were talking, I was I was going to type in and I'll, I'll put it in uh, a link to a call with the Gates Foundations around digitalization and agriculture coming up in February. And so there's two levels of funding around a hundred thousand dollars and and for pilots and two point five million for scale ups. So there's funding out there. It's really important to 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 stay connected. Uh, Rockefeller has the the uh, data uh, challenge, a huge program that uh, they launched in the summer for ten million dollars ten. 
<laughs> yeah, ten million dollars uh, around how are we using data to make sure that marginalized communities aren't being left out and, and ensuring uh, jobs of the future in terms of youth. So these are really important spaces that uh, are complex and it's how do we ensure that we keep connecting people to accelerate how uh, these skills can really help um, and uh, be uh, anchored in, in indigenous languages. Thanks, thanks, Ileana. Ben, I, I, I want to come back to you and slightly change course. So uh, um, I was very interested in your contribution um, at the outset, uh, how you saw as the pandemic ensued, um, more household usage, perhaps less business usage initially, and I think that happened when people moved to, to their homes. But that triggered a question for me. I mean, what do you think is the relative contribution that um, that business, the private sector, government, and households have to make to the expansion of infrastructure. Because I, 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 you know, I, I don't buy it that this is only a government responsibility. In fact, for many households, um, you know, a lot of the individuals of the internet is entertainment, quite frankly. It's not necessarily business. Um, so, what do you see in, in, in where this burden of expanding infrastructure is falling? Um, yeah, it's a good question. So, you know, when it comes to um, when it comes to Africa, uh, nearly all of the infrastructure which is powering the digital economy has been, you know, built by private sector, and and I'm, you know, it's. Uh, whether it be telcos, it doesn't have to be telcos, but they've had a large part in it. Um, and um, we obviously, uh, we specialized in fiber optic infrastructure um, and we've put in data centers and then, you know, people are bringing a cloud uh, to these data centers. And, and, and this is, you know, some enabling technologies it all becomes infrastructure. Um, but then we look in, into, uh, you know, mobile money and the mobile, trans, you know, this is a transformative Technology and 10 years ago was an innovation, but now the mobile payment platforms in Kenya, Zimbabwe, um, you know, where they're quite dominant in, in terms of the, the economic drivers of, of making payments across the country, they're infrastructure also. These platforms become infrastructure. Um, and as we get more and more uh, digital platforms going on top of starting with fiber, data centers, and then cloud and these other things, mobile money, they add on, right? So uh, when we come to e-commerce, e-commerce in Africa is uh, taking off very slowly, uh, but largely being enabled by those pioneers in the space, you know, setting up networks of, of motorbike guys, picky pickies or boda bodas, we call them, um, but, you know, guys on motorbikes delivering stuff. And, and those companies in the e-commerce space have had to build those networks using digital platforms to track where they are and track, you know, when the goods are arriving and stuff like that. But these digital platforms then become further layers of infrastructure. In the absence of um, stuff like addressing schemes, proper physical addresses, you know, digital platforms and, and, and pins and, uh, you know, coordinate-based digital platforms becoming part of a lacking digital address system. You know, where we're missing and governments need to pull up their socks is in digital identities. Um, you know, if government have not built broadband, have not built mobile money, not built. India's built all of these themselves. The government has pushed to build a lot of these infrastructures. Um, but, you know, governments need to catch up on some of these things and, and focus on digital identities and, and some of these enabling technologies. But I, I also want to, um, in connecting people is really important. And, um, you know, the mobile phone is, you know, uh, a device which is, the phone, the device that most people own, first of all, to get on the internet. So it's important that people get, you know, this is their first device and then get, you know, further devices like a laptop and, and, and other uh, devices that might they might access these technologies with. But, you know, globally, um, there are more connected things than there are connected people. So there's about 20 million connected uh, IoT devices, 20 billion IoT connected devices globally to about six and a half billion people. In Africa, we're seeing that's way less. And in Kenya, maybe it's 1 million connected devices to about 45 million population. So really, really low. But, you know, really um, picking on you know, a lot of stuff Eliane was talking about, and a lot of stuff we've been doing is around we've put out a network of, uh, you know, network especially for IoT devices so that farmers, um, 
you know, farmers and farming can be transformed by having lower cost devices, lower cost soil probes, weather stations, you know, um, things to automate, uh, automate pumping and irrigation. These don't necessarily have to be um, things that are purely, um, you know, done by farmers. You're sending them information, they're sending you information back. It's not just person to person information. If you have machines collecting the information and, and taking the actions automatically, not only does it make the information more more correct uh it, it it saves the um it saves the farmer time and and if you can um you know farmers in many ways they're not poor they're rich right and they, they, in the lives they have they, they may well be you could look at them and say they're having a rich life but they're poor on time um and they might spend this many hours a day doing this particular function pulling up water doing this if you can automate that and say okay well let's let's have a soil probe um we measure that when it needs watering They'll automatically pull up water when it's required and irrigate. If that can save the farmer four hours a day that he might even have been doing, or he or she might have been doing when they didn't even need to, then they have more time to to get on the internet and, and, and get educated about more things. So, um, and really, uh, Eliane, this thing about making te te technology and farming making um, it sexy for youth. So I so agree with that. And, and I was presenting earlier this year um, at a, the group some of the winners from last year's young scientist kenya which is also ongoing the 2020 exhibition is ongoing this week but i was presenting at some of those and i was asked the question what would you be doing now if you weren't doing um what you're doing and and having been in Ken kenya seven years they you know the obvious thing that jumped out to me i said i'd be a farmer right it's the most obvious thing that you'd be doing and and these kids you know all of them 17 to 18 they, 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 you know, gave me a round of applause just for saying this, and I couldn't believe it. But you know, the 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 fact that people in technology are interested in farming is, is and and implying technology in farming is, is making it very interesting for people who would not have been thinking about this career before. So I'm really, really you, Eliane, on that. So, so Ben, you are starting the farming is cool movement by the sounds of it. Um, to get farming Eliane, cool. I mean. Yeah, for me is cool. And I didn't understand it when I got to Kenya. I asked somebody who was bright in our organization, I said, well, you know, what are your career aspirations? She told me I want to be a farmer. I said, what? What's wrong? Um, then I've been here seven years now, stand, right? But I didn't get it when I first arrived. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Then it's working. I mean, we've believe it or not, we've got three minutes left, but I want to um Annabelle and, and I want to help um George to catch up with his timeline. Um but Annabelle, I've I've got a question for you. It, it's you know, what the digital world is doing, it's making so much of what was always invisible in Africa visible. So who do you think on the digital side is leading the visualization of Africa, the, 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 coming, the, the, the coming onto the formal economy of Africa? Do you think it's the platforms? Is it the financial sector? Is it social media? Um, who's... Who's leading the data revolution for us in, in Africa? No, I was just going to say, that's a, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think there's lots, lots of yeah, really exciting kind of um, innovations happening, you know, across um, the finance sector, across platforms. I think social media is something that is definitely, and I saw a, a question in there around kind of social media um, uh, in the ag sector. And I think that's something that we really should um, keep an eye on. I mean, lots of the work that we've been doing is around uh, digital platforms. And often people look at the platforms that have been developed, you know, for business use. So, you, you know, e-commerce platforms, ride hitting platforms. And often what is, you know, traditionally social media platforms are developed for kind of entertainment or um, social purposes per se. But what we've been increasingly is lots and lots of business activity happening through these social media platforms be it you know huge um farming facebook pages um to you know um big kind of um, buying and selling groups and i think what's really interesting in terms of um again kind of relating back to this whole question around kind of access to digital infrastructure and tools there's a much lower barrier to entry on these social media platforms you know you don't have to be uh, a formal um 
business, um, anyone can join, you know, the um, digital literacy requirements are arguably lower. It's a tool that people are more accustomed to using in their day to day lives. So the transition to use it for business uses is, is a lot easier. Um, and so a lot, a lot of kind of increasingly a lot of interesting uh, business transactions and activities are happening over these social media platforms from Facebook to WhatsApp, Telegram, etc. So I think keeping an eye on what's happening on these platforms um, is really is going to be really interesting. As, and, you know, if we are able to capture a bit of the kind of data and activities that happen there, I think we'll um, yeah, reveal lots of interesting kind of insights and future developments. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Annabelle. And I think you're entirely right. Um, um, the, the, the the digitization of, of business in Africa is far more advanced and African people are unbelievably innovative in using these, even what's seen as low technology models to become um, very savvy in, in the business world. So thank you very much to to all of our um, four, um, four panelists. Um, Eliana sitting in um, in, in Canada, Ben um, digitizing and rolling out infrastructure when he's able to get into Africa. Um, Komi, will, Komi, I've got, I think, days of conversation on education. You really triggered that extremely well. Um, and Annabelle, the platforms fascinate me, but I think you're right. Social media is probably leading the way if we can capture what's going on there. Um, so thank you very much to all the panelists. Um, digitalization will accelerate. We've got that guarantee from the pandemic. Um, thank you for your contributions. Um, George, we're only one minute over. Do we get a prize? <laughs> thank you very much to the panelists. I think the prize goes to Ben, Eliane, Annabelle, and Komi, you know? <laughs> well, and you too. Most so for not dropping the average. I saw. Uh, I heard you guys talking about the average age of farmers. Was it fifty nine? Yes, 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 yes. And you were I'm, saying you were about to. I'm I'm dropping the age. I'm not increasing it. So I'm on the <laughs> side. I'm cool like Ben. You see. <laughs> oh, yeah, like Ben. Yeah. So so I just a, a lot of crucial things were mentioned. I'll just highlight five. One was the average age of farmers. Two, uh, Alibaba approving uh, digital loans in three minutes. That's why huge economies are, uh, you know, like killing it at the moment. So that's something we need to work on. Uh, increasing access to content experience. Of course, the language issue. Uh, we, we see it as a different sign of diversity that needs to be cultivated. That was crucial. We have more connected things than people. That was a very crucial point. Very crucial point. And then farmers are rich but poor on time mainly because a lot of systems uh, processes need uh, aren't automated. So there's a lot more that you said. Uh, I was writing until my finger hurt. There was so, so much, so much from you, valuable stuff. So Ben, uh, Eliane, Annabelle, uh, Komi, and of course, Henny, thank you very much. Thank you. Good. Thank, thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you. So what's going to happen now? We have a quick 12 minutes. Henny did the best best session i've seen today at least because we were held up on time so it's just three minutes over um people are going to network until top of the hour so it's just about 12 minutes and then what's going to happen we'll have parallel session one with two breakout sessions mm -hmm. that's going to happen at uh, that's 5 p.m kenyan time 4 p.m uh, rwandan time um, breakout session one will be tapping into the virtual workforce to stimulate youth transition to employment with the moderator as Dr. Peter, uh, the Senior Program Coordinator at Ames Canada. At the same time, we'll have another breakout session uh, that is going to highlight top COVID-19 innovations from Africa with a highlight on entrepreneurs and researchers. So I know a lot of people keep saying uh, COVID-19 has had a very heavy uh, impact on a lot of people, but out of the rough has come some amazing innovations. So the moderator for that conversation will be Salar Chagpa, uh, Chagpar from Canada. After that parallel session, um, we'll have the NEF Fellow Spotlight session, uh, just a video showing uh, the third group of uh, NEF Fellows, the class of 2019 to 2021. And then after that, we'll have our final parallel sessions. So breakout session one and breakout session two. But I will come back to speak more about it. So for now, please go to the lounge and uh, engage as much as possible. We'll be back in just 10 minutes. So when you see the sessions open up, just go there to the breakout session that you want to uh, get into. So I'll see you later, much, much, much later.